Today I'm going to talk about how um, some of the future projects we're working on at Elsevier, um, particularly within Reaxis, and um, how also we're using Chemaxon technology to do that. So, um, as hopefully many of you know, um, within the Reaxis uh, and the life science solutions at Elsevier, we're working very much in um, drug development, as many of your clients also are. And particularly with Reaxis, we're very much focused on uh, the early stage of drug development. So taking compounds from HIT validation, lead generation, through to lead optimization. Of course, this is an incredibly uh, complex task, requiring input from uh, multiple teams and disciplines, and it's, it's a really huge challenge. Um, and part of that uh, challenge comes down to this design make test cycle, which has already been referred to several times today. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is really um, how we're trying to think about this in the development of Reaxis and Reaxis Medicinal Chemistry so that we can best support our users throughout this uh, design make test cycle. And the reason that Reaxis fits in pretty well here is because along this route, there's uh, huge amounts of information coming from both in-house knowledge, but also uh, published knowledge um, that needs to be leveraged to make really informed decisions, uh, go and no-go decisions at each point of the cycle. So at Reaxis, that's really what we're doing. So we're taking information from patents and from literature, we extract the information, we normalize the data, we put it into uh, what we hope is a user-friendly interface, uh, which gives actionable insights so you can make decisions across this. And generally, we think we do a pretty good job. Um, but today, I'm going to talk about some of the other aspects that we're working on to try and make sure we're doing even better here. Before I move on to those future projects, what I just want to discuss is actually how we're already using um, Chemaxon technology within the Reaxis workflow end to end. So um, when I talk about the workflow, I mean around manual exertion. So when uh, we look at the patents and literature documents, you know, the extraction of the facts um, is currently predominantly done manually. And for this, we use um, key Chemaxon technology. Then I talk about uh, the architecture, so how we actually build and maintain the database. Again, uh, key components within um, Chemaxon technology here. And then finally, uh, front and center, the, the web-based application that our users use, uh, Marvin Sketch is, uh, Marvin JS is one of the, the key structure editor drawers inputs on, on the web application. So again, a really key part. But what I'm going to talk to you today is about some of the future projects we're working on. Um, and again, this really comes back to driving our users and improving the experience they have during uh, drug development and around this design, obtain, uh, test, and analyze cycle. And where I'm going to focus today is really around um, the, the sections I've highlighted here, so around match molecular pair analysis, um, predictive pharmacology space, and also around um, predictive retrosynthesis as well. OK, so talking about match molecular pair analysis, um, everyone heard of match molecular, match molecular pair analysis in the room? Yes or no? OK, well, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so what um, this is used for is to try and overcome some of the common issues during drug development. So for example, when I was working in the lab, there may be you have your lead compound, but you know particular aspects of that compound um, are causing issues, potentially poor solubility or cell permeability. And you need to know what part, how you can replace that substructure of that compound um, to give you optimized properties while maintaining activity on your target. And this is, this is quite a big challenge. Um, and Often, um, and I know I was guilty of this myself when I was in the lab, is that I'd have you know five to ten replacements I would use all the time um, uh, when thinking about these replacements. What that does, it means you become very contained in your own knowledge space. Um, and what we're trying to do with uh, match molecular pair analysis is drive people into a, a more diverse chemical space and give them more ideas and expand their knowledge base. So really, what should the researcher make next? So match molecular pair analysis looks at what happens um, to maybe physical chemical properties or bioactivity when you make so small substructural changes to a molecule. For example, if you change the amide for an acid or you change your linker here from a, from a benzene to a furan. So what, what happens um, in terms of the properties? 
Um, so you can do this with many FizChem properties, but predominantly this is done with bioactivity data, just because of the wealth of that information um, that is available there. So we decided to embark on a project using the data from Reaxis Medicinal Chemistry, which is, um, has huge amounts of bioactivity data. And we partnered with the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics to run uh, a match molecular pair analysis on the data we had coming from our database. So uh, this involves taking the data set, uh, running um, a pair identification, extracting those pairs, storing them in the database, and then um, calculating the outcome of the, of the pairs. And we're really pleased to see that we got over 9.5 million uh, molecular replacements um, from this system, which is uh, two times more than any commercially, uh, sorry, uh, commercially available uh, public or publicly available data sets. With that, we weren't just happy with the, uh, the analysis. We wanted to actually put this in the hands of our researchers to test. So we then created some web applications with the SIB uh, and, and handed this out to, to researchers to test and validate. But importantly, along this step, um, we have uh, Chemaxon technology embedded within this. So in terms of the back end, um, we've got uh, JChem suite for handling uh, the molecules and fragments and also calculating some of the um, physical chemical um, properties and descriptors. And in the front end, uh, obviously, Marvin uh, JS Sketcher is, is front and center in the applications and uh, JChem web services for m uh, molecular uh, image handling. So once we had our applications in hand, uh, as I said, we tested these with our, our researchers to get some, uh, some input and some feedback, whether they actually did what we wanted uh, in the first place. And uh, it was nice to see that we, we got validation of our hypothesis. So uh, we did our own uh, design test, uh, make test cycle ourselves. Um, so what our researchers came back with saying is really help them come up with some new ideas, drive creativity, and also foster collaboration between colleagues, which is really important. Um, trying to come to decisions quickly um, and, and just extending their, their knowledge base and chemical space in their series. Just as a really simple example um, that came up as quite a nice replacement was something like this aniline. I mean, aniline's a pretty much avoided uh, by default in drug discovery. They have uh, lots of flagged for lots of tox issues. And one such replacement which was suggested was this uh, benzodioxol. And this is quite an interesting replacement because um, looking at the, the data and the analysis, we saw the impact on activity was um, rarely negatively affected. Um, it's also uh, quite chemically stable. It's been done a few times, but perhaps not the most obvious replacement to make. So. Um, it was, uh, looks, looked like a good candidate. And also the physical chemical properties were not significantly um, affected negatively or, or positively uh, on this. So this is a very simple example of how this can be quite a powerful technique. OK, that was uh, a little bit, uh, I'm keeping it very brief just uh, to keep you not from coffee. Uh, would be a bad idea. Uh, so. Predictive pharmacology is also an area we're really interested in, in helping our researchers. And um, I mean, there's many things we could look at here, tox, ADME, but what we first looked at um, was around target prediction. And the reason we chose target prediction was because um, to really help researchers understand their secondary pharmacology. So again, when I was in the lab, completely guilty of this, I would optimize my compound only really looking at my target that I'm interested in and that I'm working on and kind of neglecting all the other targets that my compound might possibly hit along the process. And this leaves you quite open to, to risk. Um, if your compound is uh, going to hit secondary targets um, and their cause uh, potential side effects, you want to know that pretty early on so that you can cover that off or maybe deprioritize the project. So really what we want to do is with uh, help researchers understand what can they expect from their compound uh, outside of their primary target. Now, the assumption that you can make with any kind of target prediction, and the math stacks up here, is that if you have two molecules that are similar in shape, they're more likely to be active on the same target. So with this in mind, you take a reverse screening approach. So for example, if I've just made a compound uh, in the lab, I uh, know my primary target, but don't know too much about whatever else it's going to hit. What I'll do is I'll um, look for compounds that are similar to mine, which have known activities. So they're known activities on targets. I'm looking for that shape similarity. 
and then I can then make a list of possible targets that my compound is potentially active on. So once again, we teamed up with the Swiss Institute for this project um, and built, again, some web applications for our researchers to test. Uh, the one thing that was very unique about the uh, SIBS approach is that they take into account both uh, 2D and 3D shape similarity. And this gives a real boost in the performance when we're talking about um, looking for chemical similarity in terms of structure. Once again, I. I uh, should highlight the fact that the uh, Chemaxon technology was used here. So in terms of um, the back end, both JChem Suite and uh, JChem Web Services were used. And the front end, again, um, the web services and the sketcher, again, was front and center for these applications. So once we handed these applications again over to our customers to test, and gratifyingly, the feedback really did reinforce what we were trying to do here. So many of them used it to testing out um, off-target pharmacology and looking for maybe unexpected things. And um, particularly one customer had some absolutely golden feedback is that he actually used the predictions to adapt to his kinase panel um, and, and prioritize different um, proteins for that. And uh, when they actually tested that, um, he was very pleased with the results, which basically means that uh, he the prediction pulled up a target that he had not envisaged being a problem before. He put that into his kinase panel and it confirmed that that was hitting this target. And that's really important. So it's really understanding, bringing that uh, knowledge much earlier on in discovery that potential problems or um, issues that you need to, need to know about as soon as possible. And again, just uh, an example of how, how well the application works. Um, so we built the application on data coming from 2017. And uh, this molecule that was published in uh, 2018, so it was not in any of the training sets, um, we inputted this into the application and, um, and it was published to be active on the adenosine receptors. And when we put this into our application, we clearly see that we have uh, key interactions at those receptors as published. Um, but also it shows us that we have good probability that we're also going to have other receptors, such as the cannabinoid receptor. So this is useful information and knowledge for researchers to have to hand. OK. so. This is just one element of predictive pharmacology. We are also working in the area of uh, ADME and TOX predictions, but these are still in their infancy, so I won't uh, have time to talk about them today. So what I want to move on to is the, uh, the planning the route. So once I've got my molecules that I want to make, how do I go about that? Um, can I buy them, or do I need to make them? And as many of us know, working in the lab, it's difficult. Make, coming up with synthetic routes is challenging, takes a lot of time. And, and sometimes uh, we also, again, get constrained by our own knowledge. We all have our favorite reactions and our favorite conditions. And it's hard to keep on top of the literature as well of, of what's out there. So um, one of the um, big challenges is helping researchers find efficient and cost-effective routes to compounds and uh, trying to reduce the rate of failure of reactions. I think we've, we've all been in the lab and the number of failures of reactions is uh, quite depressing. <laughs> so um, one, uh, one technology which is really, really making a big splash uh, in, in the world at the moment is around using um, uh, deep neural networks, so AI machine learning technology uh, to try and um, leverage to come up with better ideas, more ideas, and expanding knowledge space. So it's already been uh, discussed and brought up today, is around Mark Waller's paper in Nature. Um, and this used the, uh, the Reaxis database to build, uh, to build this technology and, um, and came up, it was tested with uh, graduate level uh, chemists and got some really great feedback. So it performed very well versus not only a literature routes published by expert chemists, but also against other models, so outperformed many. Um, and there's many other advantages to this, the deep neural network technology that was developed here. So um, it's, it can take very large data sets and expanded data sets, so it's not restricted by that. Uh, it's much faster, so 30%, uh, 30 times faster than most other uh, available technologies here. Um, and it just gave really great results. So um, what we're currently doing now is um, working with, uh, with Mark Waller to try and produce a, a retrosynthesis tool that we can embed within Reaxis within the next year or so. And again, just to say that um, Chemaxon technology was used in here too. 
So just to summarize some of the benefits of predictive retrosynthesis, um, and it's really, so it's a matter of speeding up innovation and coming up and expanding knowledge, so not being constrained to our own knowledge. So augmenting, maybe a junior chemist needs to get up to speed very quickly when, when they're in the lab, so trying to, try to give them as much help as possible. And um, of course, just driving business outcomes, so increasing productivity, um, increasing speed to market, and reducing failure, and reducing the amount of time you spend on wasted and failed reactions. I would also have to say, just coming back to the last speaker's point, uh, failed reactions here are also incredibly important to help build these models and make them as good as possible. OK, uh, just to summarize, um, so what I've talked to you today about is um, the projects we're working in both the design and, and the obtain phases of uh, this cycle. And so working on match molecular pair analysis and target prediction with the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. And also in the area of predictive retrosynthesis with uh, Professor Mark Waller. So uh, underneath all of this, of course, is data coming from uh, Reaxis and Reaxis Medicinal Chemistry, um, which we believe is one of the biggest databases in the world for chemical information, and um, is very clean, it's curated, and it's normalized. So it's really well set up for this type of work. Secondly, just to uh, mention a the part that we think uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning will play in driving um, driving this area is that um, our position is not that these types of technologies are not going to replace chemists. They'll basically become a chemist's assistant. So leaving the, the boring jobs um, and the arduous jobs to, to technology, leaving chemists time to innovate and do the really, really hard stuff. So that's very much our position in terms of um, using this technology. And again, just to reiterate, um, and thanks to, to all the Chemaxon team, uh, we work together very closely uh, with you to help um, you know, develop these applications and the technology that, that you've developed is used uh, and embedded throughout. So uh, thank you very much. And then that just leaves me to, to thank uh, the team at Elsevier, uh, the team at the SIB, and uh, the team at the Waller Lab. Thank you.